Hello and welcome. I'm Jeff Miller, Technical Solutions Architect with Cisco Systems. Today we're going to cover a couple use cases with Cisco Tetration Analytics. The first of which is one of the most common use cases, also known as application dependency mapping. So being able to map all the dependencies within your data center network in order for you to be able to deploy policy-based or zero trust or whitelist networks that are commonly referred to as micro segmentation. That being said, let's go ahead and get started. So we're going to start with application dependency mapping. And I always say like any good cooking show, um, you know, it's best to start with what the end product looks like and then, um, then move backwards. So this is what we want to get to in the end, right? So this is the final result of what the application looks like, okay? And just as a way of setup, this is a simple two-tiered website, and this is in what we call a workspace, okay? Workspaces could be specific to applications, or they could be very generic. It just depends on where you are in the life cycle of dependency mapping. But as we go from the top down here, you know, we'll soon realize this is very interactive. Um, as I hover over workstations, this would be kind of the equivalent of my external users or, or things like that. And you'll notice that I see directionality and uh, what ports we're providing and consuming, right? So I see workstations are talking to my domain controllers group. I see they're talking to a group of web servers through, I see this icon right here. This tells me that they're going through a load balancer uh, because I uploaded a load balancer configuration during the application dependency map run. And I can keep going down through these and, and see the same information and directionality all the way through. If I click on any of these, you'll notice the boxes on the right change, right? I can see then what's inside these web server groupings, right? Or clusters as we call them. I get to see the names, IP addresses, things like that. I see my neighbors. I can see what ports I'm providing, consuming on down the list, right? And we'll get more into that as we go. But this is really where you end up, okay? Once you're here, you can then export this. I can export it as just the clusters or groupings themselves, or I can export the clusters and the policies. The policies would be, you know, what direction or and what ports I'm using, right? So these would be my, the equivalent of my ACLs and general networking, or they would be, you know, an ACI. They would be my contracts and filters, right? And I can export these in three different formats, JSON, XML, or YAML. These are just simple machine-readable formats that you can then take and, you know, script into whatever type of infrastructure you have, right? I got here by running an application dependency mapping. And what that means is that we're running unsupervised machine learning algorithms against all of the data that we're collecting from our sensors to group like things together and identify and tell you what ports are communicating. Okay. Now, this is a final, what it looks like, and I'm not going to, as part of this demo, we're not going to go through how to run a dependency map. That's a different demo that would probably take a little bit longer. But this is the final result. And I want to point out a couple things that are very um, uh, interesting here, is that when we're doing this, the importance of running the software sensors are so that we can see, you know, what services are running, right? I can see that I'm running Microsoft SQL, right? I can see that I'm providing port 1433, okay? That gives me the ability to confidently with my, you know, machine algorithms to say, okay, well, this is probably a database server, right? Because I not only do I see it's running database ports and communications, but it's also running SQL, all right? This is some of the importance of, you know, really driving home why we really want, um, you know, the software agent so that we can very confidently, you know, with context, come up with these application dependency maps, right? And then you'll also notice, I do want to point out the fact that you'll see these grayed out flows or, or, or ports. And basically what we're saying is that because we're also running the this, this software-based sensor, <clears throat> we can see, you know, every port that's running, even if there's no traffic for it. And this is a very good security use case. So that you could sit there and say, hey, across my data center or across my applications, I can say, you know, query, you know, in normal human language, what port, you know, what systems are running port one, two, three, 
right? I, and I'm doing this just as an application view, and we'll we'll look at this flow search later. But I could very quickly, you know, search my you know high value applications or things like that for any kind of known vulnerabilities that may just come out in the space, you know. So that's a, it's a very useful thing from that perspective as well. Another way to visualize this <clears throat> is through what we call a chord chart. And as we look at this, this is all the same clusters that we looked at in the past two viewpoints, except viewed in this chord chart view. So as I hover over any of these, I can very quickly see, you know, who, what other clusters the web servers are talking to, right? And as you look at these different chords, the thickness of the chord is proportional to how many ports are being provided or consumed in either direction. So the, the wider it is, the more ports. Okay, pretty simple. The other thing I like to point out here is that you'll notice on the Tetration cluster itself is that there are no agents installed in the workstation space. Now that workstation space could be anything, right? And this is just an example of we know that we're not going to have sensors absolutely everywhere and on every single device, but you'll still get meaningful data because traffic is passing through points where sensors are so that we can understand and get enough information about who's all talking, right? Even if we don't have sensors installed, right? So workstations are part of the policy, even though there's no sensors on them, but we know they're in the policy communication path because we see, you know, information going through the web servers who they're talking to, okay? As we drill down into any of these, we get a more expanded viewpoint of the cord. So I can click on a web server, and what I want to point out here is that you'll notice that I have a uh, load master configurations. All right, this is because when we did the uh, ADM run, we uploaded load master information, and I can go through these again and look at you know I'm um, you know using port 80. Obviously, it's a web server. I can go down through and look and see okay, on any of these services, you know, what user initiated the service, what command was used to execute the service and what is the executable, right? Again, more good information because we run the software sensor, right? We want this context information for any number of use cases, but it's very important, okay? Click out here. The other thing I wanna to touch on is our policy analysis and simulation. This is the ability for us to go back and play this policy against uh, all this data that we've collected, right? And we look at it in these four buckets over different time frames, right? So I can click on this and go back, custom, one week, whatever. But I look at it in four buckets, right? So permitted means that both the network and the policy is saying the traffic's permitted, okay? That makes sense. Misdropped is interesting because misdropped is saying that the policy is expecting the traffic to come through but it's being dropped somewhere between the consumer and provider, either by a firewall or network or ACL or something, okay? So this helps you troubleshoot something that's wrong with the policy before you deploy it, possibly. Escaped is kind of the polar opposite of that. Escaped is telling us that this is traffic that the policy is not permitting, but is making it from the provider to consumer right? And maybe it's valid traffic and maybe you want to come in here and hit whitelist the flow. What that would do is it would add it to the policy so the next time you did an ADM run it would be included. Okay? And then rejected means it was both denied by the policy and by the network. And that should make sense. The interesting thing here is we also have the ability to run a specific time frame, right? So for those applications that have seasonality, like a financial application, you can go back to the end of quarter or the end of fiscal year and rerun it against that because maybe there are more devices in play, right? Maybe you spend more things up or down and you need to include more things into the policy, okay? So it's important to know. In this next part, we're going to demonstrate the search use case. And the best analogy I can give you is that of when you go to the web to search for something. And when you go to the web to search for something, you may type in something like car, and then you get results of all kinds of car things. Then you may further add to that search, you know, a type of car, a model year of the car, a color of the car, right? You keep adding to it, and you keep getting results back very quickly. So in this next section, 
we're going to show you how we sift through tens of billions of flows very, very quickly, right? It's useless to have all this data if you can't search it and use it very quickly and efficiently. So with that being said, on to the next demonstration. So now we're going to take a look at search as really kind of generically that I call it. And this is the ability to you know, use the tetration system as a DVR or time machine or whatever you want to call it, but to go through all of this data very quickly and useful. Um, many different use cases, auditing, auditing use cases, um, you know, troubleshooting use cases, all those type of things fall into really the, the search capability. And I like to kind of give everyone a little bit of a setup before you get too far into this and just explain what we're looking at here. So you'll notice that we're looking at, you know, 1.3, almost 1.4 billion flows. Now, that's actually not very many. Um, you know, the system is capable of well north of, uh, you know, 70, 80 billion flows, right? And the experience doesn't change at all during that. So it's important to know that's what we're searching through right this minute. Um, we have our David Letterman top 10 list that you can sit here and quickly filter out the top, you know, whatever these things are, and then use those in your search capabilities. And then you have the ability to pick time ranges, okay? So one thing that I know a lot of people will say is, oh, you know, I've got something that will go back in time already. Okay, that may or may not be true. But I always like to point out that because this is built on a big data platform, specifically so you can do things like this, there is, we feel there's very little value in having all this data if you can't use it, right? So I just narrowed a search just by grabbing some random time slice there from November 10th to December 5th, right? You'll notice I narrowed from the 1.3 billion flows, I narrowed it down to 189 million, and I did it in less than a second, right? And I'll keep pointing this out as we go. But this is some of the power, right? Having all the data is one thing. Being able to use it is a completely different thing, okay? So it's very important to understand that. I'm just gonna go back to last week. And the scenario that I generally start with everyone is one of you know troubleshooting or it could be for forensics. So I'm gonna start with just from, you know I don't really care about the tetration cluster info, so I'm gonna filter flows. You'll notice every time I do this, it's incredibly fast. So I, maybe I have someone calling me for something that is wrong with um, web server, right? And I want to look at provider, host name. I know it's web01. That's the issue, OK? Also keep in mind, as I'm doing this, these are just very human language, right? I don't need to know regular expressions or anything like that to do these searches. And again, I just searched all those flows and I've narrowed it down to 400 and some thousand in sub-second searches. You'll notice my David Letterman top 10 window over here. I've got, you know, narrowed down to just provider and I can quickly see, you know, some consumer host names as well, okay? Now, maybe I also only want to include anything that has application latency information, okay? Again, narrowing down. You know, now I'm down to 72,000 flows in less than a second, okay? And then maybe I'm only interested in things that have, let's look at durations. Maybe I just want to click over here and add, you know, anything that's got a duration of, what was that, 1.19 hours. Maybe I want to change this to greater than, right? So I can actually, in these, I can change these on the fly, right? I can go greater than, equal to, things like that, and filter flows again. So now I'm going to be pretty narrow in my search, right? 40,000, and that was a little bit longer. That was a little, a little under three seconds, right? But now I've got a better idea, right? And again, I'm picking, you know, just different points in time, but I can now click through these, right? And I can see, you know, my provider consumer relationships on any of these flows, okay? I can see <clears throat> how long the flows lasted, right? That's an important one. Right, if I'm looking for security reasons, maybe I want to see you know DNS flows that have been going on for more than a day or something like that. Right, those would be indications of bad, bad behavior. But 
what we're giving you is a viewpoint at a certain period of time, what was the network latency as it was compared to the application latency, right? This is going to help you with, you know, what's commonly referred to as things like mean time to innocence, right? How do I quickly understand the comparison between network and application, right? So I just searched through all this data. Now, I was talking and doing other things in the middle of it, but I'm searching this in seconds, right? I'm searching billions of flows in seconds. This is incredibly powerful uh, for many use cases, right? The use cases are troubleshooting, forensics, auditing, going to one place to be able to search, you know, many, many things, if not everything in your data center, right? The other thing I will quickly try and show is another way to view this data is what we call explore, right? And as this builds out, and we're not going to probably sit here and watch it build out all the time, but what we're actually doing is as this is the flows go up, we're actually drawing lines, right? So if I'm searching billions of flows, I'm going to draw all these billions of lines. That's every single flow. This is where, you know, the difference between machines and humans vary, right? Because what you're going to see, and if you can see or not, there are little lines in the high latency of network and application. So what we do with for you is we can actually stop this and toggle it to what we call an outlier view. So this is where we get into anomaly detection. We can sit there and say, show me what's different, right? I know the bulk of my good flows are down here. I don't really care about those. I, don't, I only want to see the ones that are different, right? Show me the ones that have the highest application latency. <clears throat> so I can focus in on them, right? This is very, very helpful if you don't know what's going on, right? If you just want to sit there and look at, okay, show me things that are anomalous to what's normal, right? Once we've kind of baseline things, we can tell you these things are different as compared to all other flows, okay? So these are two very powerful ways to use the search capabilities of all this data, and I will leave you with this. So I hope these couple use case demonstrations brought some better clarity and understanding of what's possible with the Cisco Titration Analytics platform. And as always, thanks for watching. Have a great day.